discoveries around the burial chamber of this tomb that I showed, just show you in the photographs, we've actually found remains of the cedar painted coffin of King Sobek Hotep, um, including coffin texts of a specific type um, that we can date. Uh, there are specific forms of spells that appear during uh, a specific phase of the 13th dynasty um, that allow us to date the time frame of this King Sobek Hotep. Um, one of the questions, of course, when you get the name of a king uh, in the form of their birth name, or the nomen, as it's called, in this case Sobek Hotep, is that uh, there are often many kings that have the same name. And in fact, for the 13th dynasty, there's seven different kings named Sobek Hotep. So discovering the name Sobek Hotep does not necessarily tell you which king you're dealing with. It would be like getting getting an inscription that says King Bob or King John or something. Um, so you have to look more critically at other, other sources of evidence. But uh, there's a, a number of ways we can look at this, including the, the datable evidence of the, uh, the coffin texts um, on the inscriptions of this particular um, king's painted coffin, and narrow down uh, the time frame, suggesting uh, with great likelihood that this belongs to the fourth of the Sobek Hotaps. So anyway, uh, we've been uh, exploring and uh, documenting his tomb. This last summer, we excavated this monstrous burial chamber with these huge blocking stones covering it. Um, it's not as big as Senwazit III, but it's, it's of that sort of caliber. It's a massive monument, huge investment in it. There you just see some of us standing around the, uh, the, one of the blocking stones. This is the, the entrance chamber that leads down to the, the actual entrance into the burial chamber is there on the left-hand side. Um, just a, a really kind of, again, a, an, an engineering sort of marvel, you know, the, the scale of construction in various types of stones at great depth below the desert surface. Um, and here a view of the crypt that I mentioned, um, still in place, even though it had been broken into by ancient tomb robbers, is the burial chamber of this King Sobek Hotep. Uh, tomb S9, so you can see there the recess uh, for his canopic chest, which is gone, and what, where the, the actual uh, wooden coffin and other burial elements, including the body of the king, once would have existed. Um, it's all looted out, but for a variety of reasons, we've recovered fragments uh, of his uh, broken, uh, broken uh, painted coffin. Um, this is the other tomb that's nearby, um, almost identical in, in form, which fits with the time period that we're looking at, the likelihood of uh, these uh, three kings ruling in rapid succession. This is the other one, uh, tomb S9. It has not provided any clear uh, evidence of identity of ownership, um, but if our understanding of the landscape and the development of these tombs and their architecture uh, plays out, um, this one should have been built before the one that we associate now with Sobek Hotep IV, and therefore is, is likely to be the tomb of Neferhotep I. Um, so really just kind of amazing tombs. One of the things we're doing at South Abydos um, is uh, 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 conducting in association with the excavations. We're doing conservation and site management work. I didn't put in, in any slides really of this work, but um, over the entrance to the tomb of Senwazret III, we've built a protective cover building uh, which allows it actually to be opened very easily. There's an iron door that you can open with a key and go into it and climb on down into the tomb. Uh, when we're done excavating it, people will be able to, act to enter it. Visitors and tourists can come. Um, we're, gonna, we're doing the same things with these other tombs as well, and we hope that um, a, a number of these tombs will be visitable in the future. So it will, be, will become sort of, a, a sort of a small valley of the kings, and in, in fact, a very unique place in Egypt where you can see uh, tombs of this particular type that you would, would not be able to visit anywhere else uh, in the country. Uh, just some views of the, uh, the other find that is likely associated with this family, this, this group of three kings of the 13th dynasty. Uh, very, a very exciting discovery back in 2013 that in fact sparked the whole adventure and sequence of discoveries that has led to the identification of Sobek Hotep and likely Neferhotep um, is this other cha chamber, this monolithic stone crypt that you see here. Um, this is the remains of another one of these complexes um, that was abandoned for some reason. They quarried and dressed and brought a royal burial crypt uh, to this location. There's a, remains of a brick enclosure that surrounded the site. 
And they began the early stages of cutting down into the subsurface to set this crypt um, down. If it, would be, if it was like the other ones, it would be at a depth of about 10 meters uh, below the desert surface. Uh, but it's, it's sitting there just about two meters below the, the, the modern surface. It was left, abandoned. It's an abandoned complex. Um, but it was a very exciting thing to find. Um, it weighs about 60 tons. So you can see now what that crypt below the blocking stones in the other two tombs that I just showed you, what that actually looks like. It's a solid mass of stone within which is cut um, a recess, a re rectangular recess for the body, um, the, the sarcophagus itself would have been set into there. Um, at one end, a, a square recess that would have been the, the, the uh, place for setting in the canopic chest. Um, so the, the whole idea behind these tombs is to render the burial chamber as a, a solid kind of impenetrable mass of stone that no tomb robber can ever break into. Um, in every case, these kinds of techniques failed in ancient Egypt, um, and these tombs were robbed. Um, but this one never seems to have been used for its intended purpose. Uh, but we had a lot of fun excavating it. There you see the process of digging it out. Um, quite fun. Um, one of the things that one does, of course, when you finish excavating something like this is, well, you just have to have fun with it. Um, we, we joked around about filling it up with water and using it as a, a, a swimming pool. Um, my in Egyptian inspector was very keen on this idea, but um, we figured it would well, be hard to get that much water out to this remote part of the desert, so we didn't do that, but we all had fun climbing into it. Uh, here's one of the excavators uh, at the site, uh, one of the Penn graduate students, Shelby Justel, pretending to be the anonymous king who may have been intended to be buried there. And then we, of course, were wondering how many people could fit into a giant 60-ton <laughs> burial chamber of the 13th dynasty. Um, turns out about 30 people can clamber on into the interior of it and sit along the side of it. So a lot of the guys that dug it out are sitting there. So we had quite a lot of fun. Um, in all likelihood, I mean, it's, it's a theory. I, I don't know that we'll ever be able to prove it, but um, the, the, in terms of the surrounding monuments and the probable um, attribution of them to Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV, uh, this third abandoned complex may well belong to this third brother. Here you see a statue of him, uh, Saw Hathor, who was the crown prince of Neferhotep I and may have briefly ruled, but didn't live long enough. So um, we've come full circle um, to Senebkai, and I'll finish up here in just five or ten minutes with a, a, a quick look at him and uh, the exciting discovery of the tomb of Senebkai. One of the things that is really fascinating in the recent discoveries at Abydos, if we just go back to this plan here, um, is that um, after these great tombs of these Middle Kingdom pharaohs were built, um, about a century later, um, about 1650 BC um, through about 1600 BC, additional kings came along. These are the kings of what we today call um, tentatively the Abydos dynasty. Um, these smaller tombs, including that of Senebkai, um, they were added um, adjacent to these pre-existing tombs. Um, in fact, one of them decided that he wasn't going to bother building his own tomb. He was just going to stick a vault um, on top of this abandoned sarcophagus. Someone used this a long time after it had been quarried as their own burial chamber uh, by adding br a brick structure. And here you see the remnants of it. This originally had a vault and other elements that were fitted to it. It's a secondary reuse. And in fact, the whole place, um, these second intermediate period royal tombs, uh, were essentially kind of cannibalizing and uh, making use of the materials from these rich burials of the Middle Kingdom. This is the period when I think the tomb of Senwazert III itself was first broken into, and in fact, the tomb of Sobek Hotep IV, probably, this tomb S10, that was probably entered also at this time period. Uh, these are kings that are not just coming and linking themselves with early, more, earlier, more powerful kings, but they're in fact sort of robber pharaohs. They are part of the tomb robbery process. They're taking valuable materials from earlier pharaohs of this 
high point of the Middle Kingdom and recycling them in their own tombs. And we can see that in a number of ways, not just this reused chamber. Um, we can see it very clearly in the tomb of Seneb Kai. Um, so let's take a look quickly at it. Um, we discovered it back in 2014, and um, the publication of it is, uh, uh, should be done, in fact, in uh, several months. Uh, hopefully it will be out next year uh, with details of the, the, the discovery and the analysis of the materials. It was really exciting to find this tomb. One of the, the wonderful things in it is painted decoration with uh, cartouches and the, the texts that record the name of the king, beautiful images of goddesses connected with the royal afterlife. Um, so giving us the identity of this formerly unknown pharaoh. Really touching texts. When I read these texts, they're very simple ones, but beautiful statements on Egyptian ideas of the death of a king and what might happen to him. Uh, uh, painted on the walls of the burial chamber is an evocation of the king to rise up uh, to come back to life. Um, he's actually addressed in the text, O oh, good God, Lord of the two lands, Lord of ritual, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Woster Ibre, the son of Re, Senebkai, justified, beloved of the four sons of Horus. Raise yourself up. Don't let death you know, be a, a hindrance. Um, you're supposed to kind of raise yourself back up into the afterlife. Um, one, of the, one of the fun things, I don't know how fun it is, but um, issues